morning to everyone. How are you guys today? Okay, so we got a few excited people out there today. Well, great. Uh, my name is Pastor Rodney. I'm one of the assistant pastors here. Um, and we just want to welcome you here today. If you're online, welcome and glad you're here to just join in us. Um, our lead pastors are out on sabbatical for the next few weeks, and it's just a great opportunity. We had a small five-minute conversation uh, with them this week, and you could just tell in their voices that there was something there. Uh, they were enjoying life a little bit. Not that they don't enjoy it here, but you can just tell that how relaxed they started to become as they were, you know, taking some time away to just unplug and get away from things and then really just get back invested into God and just see where his vision is taking the church. So we just celebrate with them and we're so proud that they can do it. But we're also proud as assistant pastors that we all get the opportunity to jump up front because, you know, we wouldn't be a pastor if we didn't want to get up front every once in a while and share our hearts about a few things. So just celebrate with them and thank you for being here. And as you came in today, you might have uh, received one of these with your bulletins, the small group catalog. It's our summer edition. Um, kind of sounds funny saying summer editions when today we're going to have like sweatshirts on, you know, but it is our summer edition and they start up in one month. So we will have um, our tables out there for signups this uh, over the next four weeks. So if you want to be a part of a uh, summer small group, you can take this home this week and look through. Um, there's just over 30 groups inside of here, anything from ice cream groups to normal Bible study groups, just whatever it is that you think that you just might want to connect with some people this week or this summer um, as we grow. But it's also a great opportunity for you to invite those that are in your surrounding area just to be a part of a group and really start the discipleship program to start leading them to Christ. Amen? So as we go, we're going to move on here for a few seconds. That was my little plug for the day. Um, let's just bow our heads real quick as we just open up in prayer before we jump into the word today. Dear Jesus, we just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity today that we have to just come here and worship you, Lord. Lord, we are so thankful for all of our mothers who are here today that we just appreciate them and value them, Lord. But today, Lord, open our hearts and our ears to just hear something new and learn something new about you today, Lord. But also, keep me humble and use me as a vessel, Lord, to give your message to the congregation today. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Well, to pick up where we left off last week, I really try to figure out how I can connect weeks. And it's one of the great things that I loved having a second week in a row because I could really build off of last week to something else and really going back to what church on mission really means. And it really means that God is doing something in us so that eventually he will be doing something through us. And so everything we're going through now is really a preparation for what he's going to do through us later on and how he's going to use us in our lives. And I think, wow, what a great opportunity that is. And so last week, uh, we spent some time talking about um, struggles, and I called it the what-if factor. And the what-if factor, if you weren't here, was really helping us to look at some of our struggles in a different way to think that God was really using those struggles to prepare us for later periods in time where we're walking with him. And I loved Luke 22. It was one of my favorite verses. In Luke 22, it says, Simon, 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 Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But Simon, my prayer for you, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail and that you will be able to return and strengthen my bro or your brothers. And I think that's such a great thing because it says that we're all being sifted like wheat, but we're going through some struggles but God is already praying ahead of us when we go through some of those struggles, hoping and praying that our faith will not fail. And so this week, I wanted to pick up right where we left off last week and start with a different one and a different step two of the process of sometimes of what we go through. If you remember last week when we talked about the struggles, we, we looked at Job and some of the middle part of the, of the book of Job of where his real struggles were and how he complained to God. And then we looked at another guy by Jeremiah, and we looked at, here's a young guy that is doing exactly what God called him to do, but yet he has some struggles and some complaints to God. And then we looked at Psalms 13, David, who is to believed to be one of the greatest kings that come out of Israel, and we saw one of his darkest moments, and where he just thought God was not there and wasn't seeing him, and how long will you not look at me, you know? And so we saw this, but then we saw 
God kind of changed the hearts and God started to bring things around and some of that testing was for their futures and for things that God was going to use them for, which brought us back to Luke 22 of the sifting and God's prayers for us. But this week, I'm calling it, Don't Camp There. Now, I heard a few laughs, that's okay, I'm good with that, but it's just, you'll see where it's going. And I call it the Don't Camp There because this is a terminology that Wendy and I have have in, put into our lives over the last couple of years to always remind ourselves of this very thing. And what it is, it deals with bitterness. So let me define bitterness for you and the way that I want to say that we're going to use it today. So bitterness is a feeling of deep anger and resentment. Bitterness is an emotion which encompasses both anger and hate. Now bitterness is something that dwells inside of each and every one of you. And it takes such a, it's so easy to fall back into it. I say that bitterness is used by Satan to remind us of our past. It, he uses bitterness to remind us of all the hurts. You know, when we think about being bitter or angry about something, when something pops into your head, it usually could be like one word. And it takes you right back to the hurt. One look, you know. If you're, like, if you're a guy like me and my wife, she kind of does this to me like that, it's like, okay, here, okay. You know, it's like it reminds me of something. She's looking at me. What did I do wrong? It takes me back to a place of resentment, of anger. Not that she's disappointed, just that she's going to give me a good look to remind me of what we agreed on a long time ago and take me back to that point. But resentment can boil up so fast. And I'm going to give you a quick story because, you know, that ha this happened to me this week. You know, if you've never had the opportunity um, to participate in the night of worship, well, this past week was an amazing night of worship. One piano and two voices. And it was just awesome. Well, what happens with the night of worship is typically Pastor Mark is here and he handles all the you know, the talking and, you know, the scriptural references. He handles all of that. Well, with him being on a sabbatical, like, we just didn't think. I didn't think. None of us really thought, like, well, who's going to do the speaking? And so we're like, shoot, I got it. And so I ran back to my office. I get into my office, and I start thinking, like, okay, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to talk about? You know, what am I going to spend 15 minutes on talking and discussing when it comes to worship and a night of worship? And so I went right to true worship. And I was like, great. So I went scriptural references. I went right down the Bible. But if you don't know my history, here's my history. That in all the jobs that I've ever had, it's always been based around performance. It's always been based around how efficient I can be. And so how well I get things done. And you shouldn't waste time. If it's a waste of your time, you shouldn't be doing it. Well, when we got here to the night of worship, after spending a couple hours back in in my office and just thinking what I was going to talk about real quick, I sat right here on the front row and it was never clear, never date. God's just like, shut your mouth. And I mean, I immediately, I, I mean, I was like, pop, I went right back to everything, every job had ever taught me like, okay, now you just wasted time. Now you're not proficient. Now you're not being efficient in what you do. Two, and right in my mind, I was like, all right, God, at this, we're going to have a conversation because I just wasted two hours of my time trying to get ready for this. And you should have told me back then when I sat down not to waste my time that you were going to take over and I wouldn't have to worry about this. And God says, but I wanted you to experience true worship. I wanted to see if you sat there and that you would actually like listen to me and be quiet and not try to make it something about you. And it was one of the most amazing nights. Like, we've had a lot of great nights with night, uh, praise and worship. But this is just personally, for me, was one of my absolute favorites that I sat right there. But I went back bitter so fast, so quick. I went right back there. You know, sometimes you can think about, like, a job. Like, if you've lost your job and you're at a new job right now, and all it takes is one word. All you have to do is hear a rumor of somebody saying, hey, they're getting ready to lay some people off, let people go. And you go right back there. You're mad. It can't be you. You can't lose another job. You can't get cast away from that job. It takes you back to the hurt. You know, it might be a struggling in your relationships. It could be one word that comes from that that takes you right back to the hurt of a past relationship. But do you realize it can also be a celebration that takes you back in resentment? 
Because you can be celebrating with somebody else and still have resentment and anger on your side because you can be in a celebration of somebody having a child and you've never been able to have one. And suddenly you're there celebrating with them, but in the back of your mind you're also bitter about something. Bitterness is huge. And this thing about don't camp there is really some stories in the Bible that teach us don't camp there. Don't stay in the bitterness for certain reasons that God lays out in the Bible. And so I want to spend some time on that today. I want to kind of jump into two stories, one coming out of Exodus and one coming out of another favorite book of mine of Ruth. And we want to look at these two stories and compare bitterness and what God says about bitterness and what it also says about don't camp there. Don't stay there. So let's start in Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 24. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what do we drink? Okay, so let's, let's bring you up to speed on where the, uh, the story of Exodus is right now. The Israelites have been in captivity under the Egyptians for 430 years. Matter of fact, the Bible says that they've been in captivity for 430 years to the day that God took them out of Israel, or Egypt. And so Israel is now leaving out of Egypt, and they start to move about a million people coming out. That's what the record shows, 600,000 men plus women and children. So about a million people leaving out of slavery. They've left the struggle, okay? They've left the struggle of where they were at. They're walking in the desert. There's a little bickering going on, but God is leading them by the clouded during the daytime and by fire at night where they should be going, and then they come to the Red Sea. They come to the Red Sea, and now they're wondering, okay, what in the world's going to happen now? There's a sea in front of us. We can't cross it. And yet, the Egyptians are coming to kill us and take us back into captivity. And there's a lot of complaints saying, we would have been better off dying in Egypt than ever dying out here in the desert. And then God shows up reminds them, proves himself to him, reminds them by splitting the Red Sea for them to walk across, and the Egyptians come in, the Red Sea kills them, drowns them all in the Red Sea, and they are on the other side of the Red Sea on this plot that holds about a million people. And then during this period of time, they are celebrating, they are partying, they are worshiping God, they are saying all these great things about God, and then God starts to move them again. Now, here it comes to the part, because God starts to move them, and it says, in three days they came without no water, and they came to Marah, a place of bitterness. Three days. Three days, and they were right back in Egypt, wondering about all their struggles, because they were out in the desert without water. And then they see water, and I'm sure that this was not like a little puddle or a pond. Okay, there's a million people coming to it, so it had to be large. You're in the desert, you see it, you're excited, you're probably getting even more of a cotton dry mouth because you're just waiting for that cool drink of water to come out of, the, out of Mara, and you get there and it's bitter and it's no good and you can't drink it. Bitterness crept back in on them and took them back to where they were in enslavement. That's where they wanted to go back to. It took them back there. Watch where else it goes. Exodus 15, 25 says, Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, and he threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. Now, I usually use all NIV for my messages. It's pretty safe. I like it. I enjoy it. But this is one of those scriptures where I love the King James Version. And watch what it says in the King James Version, because it's slightly different. And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Now, how do you walk in the desert 
out in the hot and you miss a tree. You ever think about that? Like, how did they miss the tree? Because they never saw the tree going into their bitterness, but the tree was actually in there, there, planted, there, growing in their bitterness. And they never saw it. They never mentioned it until God showed them and reminded them of what it was. But here's the thing about a tree. A tree is always planted for the future. Okay? Like this. Like when you take a tree and you plant it, even if you buy it in a sibling, you really don't get any shade out of the tree. You kind of just stare at the tree and you hope. And you come out next year and you're like, oh, I got like two or three more inches off the tree. Wow. But in about 20 years, that tree will be full grown and then suddenly its provision is being provided. But if you looked at it this way from God's fashion, that sometime in the history before the Israelites ever made it to that point, a seed was dropped. A seed was dropped that went down into a crack into the dirt. Enough water was provided by God that the seedling started to grow and sprout. And then, after, after all of that, it was protected. No animals came by and ate it. I mean, there's donkeys and camels and mules and everything going on out there. Nothing came by to eat it. It still continued to grow. Then it was protected from man because nobody had cut the tree down. Then it was protected from disease. It was still growing. God made the provision inside of the bitterness way before they ever got to the bitter spot because he planted a tree 20-some years ago for that very moment. You see, in our bitterness sometimes we miss the provision that God puts on us or gives to us. See, we miss it because we're so bitter and so angry that we can't see something that is there inside of what we're going through and how God has ultimately provided for us because we're blinded by our past. Think about it like this. Like, you know, you might complain about not having a good job. You might hate your job. You might not like getting up in the morning and going to your job. But I tell you what, you have a job. And for whatever reason, you're at that job. For whatever reason, it's becoming your mission field. But there's probably a handful of 20 or 30 people out there that don't have a job that would take that job just because it provides for them. You see the difference? You might be struggling in your marriage. And you might be like, man, this has been a struggle of four or five years. It's been the worst ever. But yet you might run into a divorced couple that would say, we would gladly take those years back again because we would love to see God's hand restore what we thought we had lost. Different perspective. You know, I think about one of my kids, one of my sons, you know, and I think about his perspective on his life. And I, I looked at what happened when he was about 17 years old. And it's a funny story. We, we laugh about it now, but back then we didn't laugh about it of what we were going through. And he just, you know, being 17, just, he was a good kid. He never really gave a lot of, you know, a lot of problems or any kind of big trouble or anything like that. But just out of one day hanging out with his buddies, he decided he was going to shoplift. And, you know, and you're like, okay. So he gets caught. He gets taken to the police department. And on top of getting to the police department, you know, they call me. And they're like, hey, come and pick up your son. We have him down here at the police department. I go down to the police department. And I get there, and the first question out of my mouth was like, hey, how long can I leave him here before Child and Protective Services comes and picks him up? You know, I'm like, dude, that dude's going to stay for a while. You know, and so it, it wasn't. They said, no, you got to take him now because you're here. And I was like, oh, okay. But then I went, hey, you got to call your mother and tell her. And... Oh, see, that was the best, I think that was the best punishment ever because I was mad and upset, but I knew what my wife was going to do. Like, she was so mad she couldn't talk. It was just like, oh, oh, you did what, you know? And so we're just like, okay, but then we got to a point, you know, there was some grounding going on, and we, but we got to a point where we thought in our own perspectives that life was really messed up. And then there was this part of us that said, how many families have it worse than that and would gladly be there because it's better than where they're at and there's a provision here because God provided for him. He still made it into the Navy. He graduated. 
you know, Wendy didn't kill him, you know, I mean, he, he made it, he survived, you know, but the provision that was given there. And then I think about that when we get bitter sometimes and we start to think through these things of why we're so bitter and we, we miss the sight of what God has done and the provision that he has for us and we miss those things. Let's keep going. Exodus 15, again at 25, second half, it says, There the Lord issued a ruling and an instructions for them and put them to the test. He said, If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So he issues something about what's going on, and he issues a decree. And what happens here is that you see that God says, I'm going to test you again. But I'm going to test you to keep you out of your bitterness. But I want you to go through a little bit because I'm trying to remind you. If you remember from the verses before, it said that he created a statue to prove them. To prove to them means that he was justifying himself, like to remind them of how great he, that he was God. He proved them. And then now he says, if you keep my commands, if you do what I ask you to do and stay faithful and don't camp out there and be bitter in those times of struggles, then I will not bring on any of the diseases of the Egyptians. So I thought, well, what are the diseases of the Egyptians? Like, what are they? Like, I flipped through the Bible. You can go back then through there, and you suddenly go to, like, well, it's like, I don't know, you know, the plagues, you know. But that's really not in a disease of the Egyptians. So I thought, what if it's not a, what if it's not a physical ailment, but what if it's a spiritual one? What if the diseases of the is, or Egyptians was really bitterness, double-minded, anger, spite, what if those were the diseases of the, of the Egyptians? What if those things were there? You know, we, we look at this and we think that we would never have those feelings. But when we get into the bitter place, you have to trust God and look at the provisions to get out of those diseases of the Egyptians. Because those things are what make it difficult for us to get out. I mean, really, how are you supposed to Share Christ with somebody when all of the people around you look at you and say nothing but bitterness. Will anybody ever be a Christ follower, a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, if all they see in you is this bitterness that boils up in you every moment and every time? We're going to run through bitterness. We all do. It's just that quick. But it's a matter of whether we camp there or we don't camp there. It's whether we go through and see what's going on and, and see these little nuggets that God gives us, like show us these provision, God, show us what's going on. It's those little things that get us through the bitterness and take us out of the bitterness because we're reminded of how really great and awesome God really is. And then we get outside of the diseases of the Egyptians. Watch what happens in uh, 15 verses 27. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. Now, they sure didn't have a problem. I'm assuming, assuming that coming out of Mara, this time they counted palm trees, and they counted the wells. You know, they counted what God had provided. See, when they went to Mara, the devil was reminding them of everything in their past. But when they opted not to camp there and they went to Elam, God was showing them everything about their future. God was saying, look at this. I have promised to you this and I'm following through with that promise. All because they decided not to camp in the bitterness and to move forward and get everything that God has ever promised them. And they camped there because there they were proved God is great. And has fulfilling all of his promise to the Israelites. And that's exactly what God's doing in us. If we can get through and pull through the bitterness a little bit, then we suddenly see God's fulfillment of his promises in the Bible to us. All of these things start to happen. But if you remember last week, 
I talked to you about patterns in the Bible. I said there's always a pattern in the Bible, and there's always different stories and different ways that we look at things. And so sometimes I don't like to just narrow in on one story. Sometimes I like to find a couple stories to really bring it to light, to say this is something serious with God because he mentions it multiple times through the Bible. And so let me show you about a woman by the name of Naomi. Now, if you don't know much about Naomi, here's just kind of a quick glimpse of her life. She was married. Um, she lived in a town called Bethlehem. Um, we'll bring that connection in a little bit later. She was born in, or living in a place called Bethlehem. Um, after she was married, she was, or when she was married, she was wealthy. She had just about everything that she could ever want in her life. She was very successful. People knew her by name. But then famine hit Bethlehem, and her husband decided that we need to leave Bethlehem and go find food. And then we're going to go to this place called Moab. And we're going to go there where they supposedly have an overabundance of food and go live there. Now, if you don't know much about the, the history of it, it's just that Israel people, Hebrew people of the nation, was not supposed to go be at Moab because Moab were not followers of Christ. They did not follow Christ. And they did just about everything opposite of what they were supposed to do. But somehow they make it 30 miles to Moab. Now, Naomi now feels disconnected from everything she's ever known. She has now moved 30 miles, which for us today is like no big deal. It would be like going to Cleveland. But for them, it's halfway around the world because they're traveling and taking everything they have with them. And now they're in a different world. They know nobody. And then tragedy starts to hit. Their husband dies, gets killed. Her two uh, older sons who were married at the time and had married women from Moab um, were married, but they also died, leaving her with two daughter-in-laws at the time, one being Ruth and one being Ope. At this point, Naomi is with nothing. She's an older woman, and trust me, I'm not saying anything about older women. She's an older woman, and the Bible says that nobody would want to marry her. And so now she's like, okay, what do I do now? I have no money. I have no provisions. Um, I have no husbands. I have no sons. Nobody's going to take care of us. What are we going to do? Well, we need to go back to Bethlehem. And we need to go back and get connected to Bethlehem. And so on this road, they start to travel. And then um, Naomi begs with Ope and Ruth to, to go back. Because nobody in, in Bethlehem is all Israel. They will not marry them. And will not want to marry them. Um, Ope leaves and goes back, but Ruth decides that she wants to stay. And they make their way to Bethlehem, and they come into Bethlehem, and watch what starts to happen inside of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full. But the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So here she goes, Naomi and Ruth, walking into Bethlehem. And everybody recognizes them. They know exactly who she is. And they're all celebrating her return after 10 years of bitterness and brokenness in the desert. 10 years of bitterness. And she tells everybody, don't you dare call me Naomi, because when you call me Naomi, it takes me right back to my past. It takes me back to all the struggles. It takes me back losing everything. It takes me back where I don't want to go. And I'm a bitter woman, so now call me Mara. Don't call me Naomi, which means beautiful. Call me Mara, which means bitter. And there's this bitterness roaring up inside of her that she probably was saying, like, I should have never left here. I should have never gone there. I should have never done that. But she did, and now she can do nothing but remember everything that she's ever lost in her life, from her family, her husband, kids. One daughter-in-law is now gone. One stayed with her. She has nothing, no provisions, no anything. And let's keep seeing what's going on in her life. We're going to jump to Ruth 4, 14 and 15. It said, the woman said to Naomi, 
Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will, never, he will renew your life and sustain you in old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. There's this key word in there that I want to talk to you about for a second called a guardian redeemer. Because a lot of us don't know. I didn't know a whole lot about guardian redeemer until probably about a year ago where I really started to study out what this means, what this thing means to be a guardian redeemer. See, back in biblical times, in the Old Testament times, God was thought to be the guardian redeemer, where that was the restoration of Israel coming back to God, and he was the guardian redeemer. But a man named Boaz, in this story, becomes the guardian redeemer. And a guardian redeemer is somebody that is an extended family that takes on the possessions or restores. Let me read what it says that it is. It says, this is a close, influential, influential relative to whom members of the extended family could turn to for help, usually when the family line or possessions were in danger of being lost. Guardian Redeemer, Boaz. But Boaz was not really the number one, like he wasn't in the top position to be the Guardian Redeemer for that family. There were other people that were in line for that. But finally, everybody else had denied it and did not want to take on Naomi and her possessions and everything, or Ruth because she was not an Israelite. And so she, they wanted nothing to do with her. And I bet that in the back of her mind, she goes, here I go. This is why I'm bitter, because nobody wants me. I am an old woman that nobody wants to take care of anymore. But then this guy, Boaz, steps in, agrees to be the Redeemer, the guardian redeemer, and begins this process of softening her heart because some, suddenly somebody loves her. Suddenly somebody wants to bring her back into the family. Suddenly somebody finds value in her to where nobody would find in the bitterness the value. Boaz found the value and started to bring her back into um, alignment with God and in, into the lineage of Christ. And this guardian redeemer takes her back in, takes on all of her possessions, takes on everything, and restores her to where she's at, inside of Bethlehem. Isn't that amazing? That a guy by the name of Boaz could soften her heart and become a guardian redeemer that's starting to move him back and soften her heart, and suddenly things in her life are starting to change. Watch this. And Naomi 4 says this, it says, Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman lived there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Okay, let's just, let's just talk about this one for a little bit, for a moment. Now, suddenly, she is no longer Mo, uh, Mara. Did you catch that in there? Because that, this is Naomi, and Naomi, they're calling her Naomi, has a son. Because her heart is softening because of what the guardian redeemer is doing and bringing her back into lineage. Now, Ruth has a son with Boaz. Ruth goes and gives that son to Naomi for her to raise. It's not even, even her child, but goes back in for her to raise and because they raised, she raised him in the rulings and the, and the laws of Christ or God and in the laws that should be going on in those period of times, then we see the rest of it start to come into play because then we see Obed becomes the father of Jesse, becomes the father of David, who some lineage down the road is the father of Christ. And all of it comes returned because she decided and opted not to stay bitter. Do you see that? Like God is the redeemer in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ put her back into position because she opted and decided after 10 years of bitterness not to stay there. And then what a powerful mother that is that can take on the son that was not hers, raise him, raise him in the ways of God, raise him in all the laws and commandments of God, that he stayed faithful with God that 
through the lineage, Christ was going to be born, who ultimately became our personal Redeemer and Savior. The day that he stepped on the cross, the day that he got nailed to the cross, he became that guardian Redeemer who saved each and every one of us from our sins. All because Naomi opted not to continue to be bitter. That's such a powerful story of getting out of bitterness and doing the full fulfillment of what Christ has for you and what God has in each one of our lives. We can, we can run around all day and be bitter. It's not hard. As a matter of fact, it's probably pretty easy to run around bitter. I think it's harder not to be bitter than it is to deal with some of our struggles sometimes because our struggles, we can, we can get through it, but then it's the bitterness that it's, it's, we just can't let go. One word, one look, one gesture, whatever it is, can take us right back to our past, can take us right back to where the de devil wants us, right where Satan wants us. God's not calling you to go back there. He's calling you to move forward. He's calling you to go to Elam. He's calling you 12 wells, 70 palm trees. 